Hey, hi everyone, how are you? Um, hope you're having a great day. Um, we're a fairly small group, so it'll be easy for me to keep track of um, chats that you put out there. So there'll be times I ask questions or you have comments and um, I'm pretty good at watching them at the same time I'm talking. So today is um, a session that I, I've actually done with the Francophone principles as well. And I did actually a similar session, not quite the same with some teachers quite recently at OME. And it's a focus on approaching the teaching of math concepts more visually than we tend to do. So it doesn't necessarily mean just illustrations in a textbook. What it means is how do we show concepts using visual approaches? So let's get going. Um, I think that it's fairly obvious to all of us that we like digital. Uh, we like visual. We, uh, we are happy with our little iPads because we can see things. Um, people who have cell phones want things with big screens because you want to see things. So we're very big on seeing things. Even books that we like to read, we still kind of like those movies too, because whatever it is in us makes us like to see that visual approach. Um, there's lots of evidence, this is not new information, that visuals enhance learning in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the obvious ways is that it leads to greater engagement. I, I think simply more of our senses are involved, and in particular, um, eyes, and that leads students to have greater engagement. But I don't really think that's the only thing. I think it also leads to better memory of learned material or better recall. So when you see something, it's kind of easier to bring it back up into your head. You can remember it better than if you just heard it. So part of the power of visualization, I believe, is for recall, which in math is a pretty important thing. You don't want to forget things because you're often building on them. Um, we use manipulatives and have for many years in math classrooms, partly because of the kinesthetic nature and you touch things and that's a sense and that helps you make sense of things, but also because of their visual nature. So even when I don't have a pattern block in front of me anymore, I can still see it in my head. And so um, I think part of the power of manipulatives is in fact to provide visual connections to which we can uh, refer later on. So we're going to use visualization today to describe lots of math concepts. Um, I'm going to check something before I get started. Are any of you secondary people? If you are, just write yes in the chat box. I just have to know which things to dwell on, which things not. So I have a yes. Oh, Christine, it looks like you're alone. All right, you might not get quite as much. Um, lots of K to 6s in there. If you're K to 6, just type yes. Lots of yeses. Okay, K to eight. Okay, great. So I'll do some secondary Christine don't panic, just maybe a little bit less. Okay, so this is all good. K to eight. Thank you. All right. So um, one of the things about visualizing concepts is not new. This is actually in our Ontario curriculum in grade eight. It's called the Pythagorean theorem. And a guy invented this quite a long time ago. And what he said is if you look at the squares on the three sides of our right triangle, the two little squares fill up the big square. So using visual approaches to mathematics is certainly not new. But it's not just about geometry. I think visuals are powerful in algebra, in pattern, in number, in data, in measurement. And I'm going to have examples in all of those strands today. Um, I don't know, for those of you who kind of know what I do, I kind of like to make it interesting. Um, so we will try to use provocative, provocative in a good way, visuals, things that initiate conversations, and we'll use some of those today um, to lead to those rich math conversations. So here is a picture, and this picture is comes from a book called Eyes on Math, and you'll see that there's a little girl named Megan, and she's counting one, two, three, four, five, six. The there are two questions there, but I only want you to look at the first one. Which ants do you think Megan already counted? So this is a chance for you to type in your chat box. Which of those ants do you think Megan has already counted? So she said, one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you, typers. So someone says the outside group are off the grid, so in the white section. Makes sense. 
uh, the ones off the cloth, the ones outside the mat, leaving the cloth, off the tablecloth, the ones off the tablecloth, starting the ones outside the mat. So you're a very agreeable group. You're all thinking similar thoughts. Ah, but Jeff said something else. So this is good. So Lisa, no, there is not a right answer. And that is the point. So one of the things is that often many of you would say, probably I would too, that it's the ones that are off the mat because there's six of them and they feel special. And so you think it's so six you count. But Jeff said, and so with some kids, no, 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 you always start at the left. So I think it's the first six in that wiggly line, even though they're on the mat. And the truth is there is no right answer. And when I said that's the point, what I was trying to say is if I were working with kindergarten or grade one kids and I wanted them to realize that you can count in any order you wish, as long as you make sure you count everybody once, that a, a slide like this is dramatic enough for us to have that conversation and that conversation to be memorable. So it's not like in passing, I say to kids, oh yeah, you can count in any order. This is like big stuff. Oh yeah, you can count in any order. So the purpose of this visual is to initiate a conversation so that there is dispute, disagreement, discussion, and it is to bring out an important mathematical concept, which is when you count, you choose, and there's no right choice about the right way to count. Okay, here's another picture. Um, this one is more junior-ish, uh, more late primary. So I want you to look at all those cute little penguins. And the question is, do you see one multiplication? Like I see blank times blank. Or do you not? So again, you can type and say what you think. Yeah, I see one multiplication. Or no, I do not. There's not one thing going on. So Brian says no. Simcoe County says more than one. No, I see more than one. Yes, two. Yes. I'm not sure what that yes and no means. All right, we see more than one. We can see more than one. Good. Can be multiplied by one. Okay, thank you. W A P S. Wherever that is, you should tell me who you are. Okay, so. Um, you keep going on York region and type if you wish. Um, the question is, we, we actually have a disagreement here. So I'm going to propose that disagreement in a math classroom, although it is novel because we used to all say the same thing all the time, um, is that um, it's good because there are different perspectives. Um, that's what critical thinking is all about, by the way, that there's different perspectives and kids see them. And so from one perspective, I completely understand why people said no. They said, I see two, and I'm pretty sure what they're saying is there are groups of four, and so that's a multiplication, and there are groups of two, and that's a multiplication, but those are different, and what they said makes sense. But um, somebody says you can be, but there's only one. I believe there's 36 penguins, so someone could say, I see 36 groups of one and that person is right, and that's a single multiplication, 36 times 1, and I think any picture is that single multiplication. Um, other people might say, I could split all the big icebergs in half, and there would be lots of groups of 2. I think it would be 18 groups of 2, so I see 18 times 2. Other people see the little icebergs and think, oh yeah, I could stick two baby icebergs together, then I'd have two extra groups of four, and then I can say there's nine groups of four. So it's not about who's right and who's wrong, because they're all right and they're all wrong in a way. Um, it's about that you can look at things in different ways. And this discussion helps students really focus on, oh yeah, multiplication doesn't necessarily mean that the groups are already equal. It means that they could be made equal, perhaps. And that's a whole important discussion about what multiplication is all about. So here again, it's a picture. And you're engaged because the penguins are cute. And um, the picture is set up very carefully. Um, I put all the twos together so you could kind of merge them in your mind. So the idea is that the visual kind of prompts an important math discussion. Um, this is another picture. Um, this is also in Eyes on Math. And you, I, I'll tell you that all the bags have marbles in them, and that if the bag is labeled 100, it has exactly 100 marbles in it. 
And my question to you is, does the top part have more marble, marbles or does the bottom part have more marbles? And are you sure? So that's the most interesting question. Are you sure? So um, let's see what you say about whether it's top or bottom and how sure you are. So Brian says bottom, not sure, but proportional reasoning sort of leads me there. Caroline says bottom, not sure. Everybody's not sure. Is anybody sure? 90% sure. That's pretty sure. Lisa's pretty sure. Bottom sounds pretty definitive. Pretty sure. All good. All right, so while people are still telling me that, what is making you not 100% sure? Aha, somebody's telling me. Because what is extra on the top cannot add up to another 150. Bottom has an extra 100. Cool. No, not labeled 100 top bag. I hope I'm disturbing you just a little, not badly, but just a little. If the top bag had more than 100, it would make another bag of 100, so it must have less than 100, Denise says. So if the top bag has less than 100, I'm thinking Denise is pretty sure that the bottom is bigger. But Caroline realized, oh, the size of marbles could vary impacting the numbers in the unknown bag. So this is like fabulous. So this is exactly, exactly the discussion I want to have in a class. Um, you're, you're, we teach kids something in place value. You keep typing. I'm watching. That says that um, if the hundreds digit is more, it's a bigger number. This, this picture is supposed to evoke the idea that if you make the assumption, which you don't have to make, but if you did, that those two other unmarked bags have less than 100 because they look sort of less than 100. And if you assume that the marbles are the same size, so they really are less than 100, then you know for sure, for sure, that the bottom has more because that big top extra fat bag is not even enough to make another 100, and you already have the other 100 in the bottom and extras as well. But a lot of you raise, raise these other points. But what if, um, you know, like, did I mislabel it? Maybe the marbles are little or whatever. And I think that's a healthy discussion. So at the end of the day, I want kids to be thinking, well, if all the marbles were the same, which I did not tell you, but if they were, and if you could look at the bags and use reason and say, well, those two smaller bags can't be 100, then you know for sure, for sure about the bottom. But if I don't tell you all that stuff, you don't know. I think this is a healthy discussion because I want kids to know that in math, often we tell you stuff, sometimes we don't. Sometimes you have to ask for stuff to be sure of things. And this cute little, easy little picture both captures the place value concept we want to teach, but also captures the idea that we're always making assumptions and should we make those assumptions and are they good assumptions to make? So you guys were asking me about all those issues, like are they the same size and all those kinds of things. And all that is exactly what we want to have in a classroom. We don't really want someone to say, well, if it says 400, it's more than 300. End of the story. We want a bigger discussion. Um, the group from Peterborough is saying it could be more. I'm waiting to hear more from you. We're just, we're all patient waiting for Peter, Peterborough. It would have to be exactly, it would have to be exactly 100. It would be labeled as such. So you don't think it's exactly 100. Um, but we don't, it looks like less, for sure it looks like less. But somebody raised, but how do you know for sure? How do you know that they aren't smaller marbles? All that kind of stuff. So the idea of this is not to upset kids, but to make them aware of the kinds of issues that are kind of always going on in the background. I completely agree, Peter, Peter Burrow, the size of the marbles could be different. Okay, good. That one got you talking. That's exactly what we want in a classroom, is we want kids to be you and having that conversation. 
Now look at this slide. Um, there's two pictures. Actually, just look at the top number line now. Forget the bottom one for a moment. Only look at the yellow dot on the number line on the top. So tell me something you're pretty sure of about the number for that dot. Like, do you think you know what the number is? Do you think you know sort of what it is? Just the yellow one right now. Okay, so just yellow. Everybody's saying greater than 50, but not by too much. Close to 50. Only look at the top. Only look at the top. 57-ish. 50, more than 50, less than 60, close to 50, but greater. Greater than 50, less than 60. Oh, beautiful. Now, um, I would be saying to you, if you were my class, so Denise was great. She just took a stab. She said 54. Um, Therese, uh, Jess said about 57. Um, Simcoe County said about 55. Um, well, there are units in a way. I just haven't said what they are. Um, 25 represents 25 units, whatever those are. 50 represents 50 units, whatever those are. In fact, you have a sense of the size of the unit because there's 25 of those units between 25 and 50. And that's what you guys are actually using when you say things to me like around 54 and around 55. You're intuiting the size of the unit and applying it from the left to the right where the yellow dot is sitting. So I would like kids to learn from the picture, only the one on the top right now, that um, if you use a number line, you can't be exactly sure, exactly. It's kind of an estimate. Now, you might argue if I had put little tick marks there, it wouldn't have been an estimate. But even mathematically, a tick mark is an estimate because it's fatter than a single point. So when I have two numbers, I can make a pretty good estimate about what another number is. I can't be precise. That's what I want to come out of number line one. Now look at number line two and pretend the top line's not there. So the 25 is gone. It's not there anymore. All you can see right now, I should have animated this, but I didn't. All you can see is the line with the 50 and the red dot. Nothing else is there. My question to you now is, what do you know about the number for the red dot and how sure are you? So Jess thinks harder to be accurate. Denise says more than 50. Brian is completely unsure. Uh, Peterborough says greater than 50. Greater than 50, 51 maybe. Maybe three quarters. It is 50. I'm not sure about exact. No, for sure. It's not 50. Cool, Andrea. If standard number line, the greater 50 is all we know. And I think I'm with you, Janice. Greater than 50 is all you know. So I'm going to say that because there's no more reference points, which is what Therese is saying, um, that indeed we have no clue at all. That red dot could be 51. It could be 50 and 1,000th, it could be 1,714,218, weird but possible, because I gave you no scale because I only gave you one number. And when you said um, I didn't give you information, essentially you're really saying I gave you no scale. So I'm watching you typers, so keep typing. Um, so I want kids to learn from number line number two, something different than number line number one. Um, we do, I think we know that it's not less than 50 if it's a standard number line. Um, so we do know it's more than 50, and someone said it isn't dead on 50, and I think we know that too. But we don't know how much more than 50 it is, whether it's a teeny bit more or a giant amount more, because I didn't give you a scale. So it turns out having an, a sense that two numbers gives a scale. You're right, YRDSB. I didn't say it's standard, and I did say if it's standard. And so if a kid said, well, it's not standard, I would just say to the kid, so like, what do you mean? And he might say to me, or she might say to me, it's a backwards number line. And if they do, you're like, you're totally happy, and you entertain their thoughts. So the notion here is, again, letting people see things different ways, but there is a mathematical idea hovering here. And the hovering idea is that you need two numbers to make a skip. And that's sort of why the second line gives me kind of a different concept thing than the first line actually gives me. Okay, so number lines are pretty important. So these to me are pretty important concepts. 
Okay, here is a different picture. Very simple. These are meant to be analog clocks. Um, just in case you can't tell, my artistic skills are not that great. Um, in the first clock, that's supposed to be an hour hand. And in the second clock, that's supposed to be a minute hand. And my question to you is, <clears throat> which gives you a better idea about whether or not school is over? And why is that? So we'll see what you say. Okay, shorter hand is an hour and it goes around the clock less times, true. So my question is, does that give me a better idea or not? Click on left because the hour is evident. Clock on right indicates approximately five minutes past, but could be any hour. The left hour is a better predictor. The hour hand and the minute, as the minute hand happens every hour, one on the left. Left clock, if we were in my school, that's cute. Hour hand could be 1 a.m., could be morning. And then you're like, why are DSB? You're kind of snooky today. That's cute. Um, I love it. Um, so the idea is, so I'm going to come to YRDSB in a minute. If this were during daylight, um, most of you are saying, I think the hour hand is giving me more info because it looks like one o'clock-ish. And if it's one o'clock-ish, I kind of do know if school is over or not. But why our DSB says something cute, which is that it could be in the middle of the night, 1 a.m. And then I don't know, then I... I kind of thought school wasn't over when I thought it was p.m., but now I'm not so sure because it was a.m., so I'm kind of confused. Jess is doing all kinds of probability stuff. That is so cool. Um, one in 12 chances versus, help me read that other one. Okay. 19 and 24, I think she's saying. It, would be, it wouldn't be a.m. because who is at school at 1 in the morning? Well, hopefully none of you, I'm hoping. Yeah, so, okay, you guys are having fun. So the idea is, um, so the mathematical concept I'm interested in is gotcha. Um, that in the first clock, um, there is the a.m. p.m. issue, and that's like re legitimate and real. If I had told you it was p.m., you would know almost for sure whether or not school was over. If I told you it was a.m., you're not. You actually know you're not in school, so you're thinking I have a better shot with that one because with the other one, it could be 9:05 or 10:05 or 11:05 or 12:05 and whatever. So here's my game. My game is this is an opportunity for me to practice with kids how to read clocks, which is obviously in the curriculum and what we want. It's not meant to be probability, but it sort of is probability in a way. Um, so there's kind of a spillover into probability concepts, which you guys are actually being quite uh, deliberate about, which is great. And then the other part of it is the real concept I'm after, the main concept I'm, at, I'm after, is that the minute hand carries kind of less information than the hour hand. Because the hour hand secretly includes the information from the minute hand. So when I look at an hour hand, if it's 1 o'clock, my hour hand is dead on 1. If it's 2 o'clock, it's dead on 2. But if it's 1.30, I can also tell because it's halfway between 1 and 2. So if I want kids to really pay attention to what a clock looks like, this is a way to get the conversation going, to get the engagement going, to get ideas happening so that when I'm more specific and more deliberate and more telling than I am here, They'll kind of know what I'm talking about because we've already been through this whole conversation. So you can see how simple the visual is, and it led to a pretty good conversation. Okay. Um, here's another one, and this time we're going to have a vote. Um, you can look at this slide, and you can see that somebody flipped a coin seven times so far and got seven heads. My question is, what will happen next? How sure are you? So either you're sure of heads and you click heads, you're sure of tails and you click tails, or you're not sure and you click not sure, or you might not vote, but hopefully you'll vote. Lisa's not really sure. So is Deborah not sure. Lots of not sures. 
When I look at my vote, I have a high vote for not sure and a lower vote for tails and an even lower vote for heads. So this is, but Brian is pretty sure it's got to be tails. And Therese is, it's time for tails. I totally get that. So probability gets higher with each flip, which is an interesting thought. Mary Jane's not sure. So here is the math. The math is that you're actually supposed to be not sure. But there are reasons you might say the other thing. So you might say it's time for tails because it sort of is. Like we know you're supposed to get about half and half and it's not happening yet. So surely it's time for a tail. Um, but Jess points out, this looks like a fixed coin here because why would you get so many heads anyway? So a lot of kids will say it's going to be heads because there must, something, must be something wrong with this coin. I think it's heads. So I can see why you'd vote for heads. I can see why you'd vote for tails. Mathematically, I hate to tell you this, but you did pretty well. You're supposed to vote for not sure. Because we define for kids something called an independent event. Like, I don't know if you know that word. Essentially, it means every time you flip a coin, nothing that happened before has any bearing on it. You flip and stuff happens. And that's what we count on when we do our work in probability, that nothing from the past has any effect on what's happening now. It's a hugely important probability idea. And this little picture here kind of generates the discussion to make that idea come alive. Um, just for fun, do you get that as human beings, um, a lot of us do vote for tails, even though we know you're supposed to vote for not sure, because we do think it's tails turn. And um, one of the one of the analogies I might make is to a woman who has already had four boys and is trying again. So there you go. She's thinking, yeah, it's got to be a girl's turn. And so we do kind of think these things in real life. And it's kind of fun for kids to think about what it is that probability is really all about versus our intuitions, which may or may not be off. So this picture kind of just starts the conversation. Okay, here is another picture. This one isn't quite as much fun, but it's important. Um, one of the ideas in algebra that we're working very hard throughout the curriculum to develop is that an equation is about a balance. So I might show a picture like this and say to kids, so how does this picture, this balance, help you solve the equation or see the equation? Let's say see the equation before we say solve. 3x plus 5 equals 4x plus 1. Do you all see 3x's and 5? on one side and four X's in one on the other side. And I'm hoping it's a yeah. And what I'm really saying in X is, what am I saying in X is? So what is an X? X represents um, the bags. And in particular, it represents how many counters are inside the bag or how many linking cubes are inside the bag. And it is definitely something that we don't know yet. It's an unknown quantity and we're trying to figure it out. Perfect. Perfect. So the notion is if a kid had a balance like this, what could you do to see if it really is a balance? Well, right now it looks good, but I don't know how many are in the bags. So you would set up a similar kind of balance with empty bags and you'd put one in each bag. Does it balance like it doesn't look good or it does look good? And I try two and I try three. And the idea is what I'm really saying is if I can make it balance, I solve this equation. So this could obviously be done kinesthetically with a real balance, but this picture is helping kids like see this in their mind so that when they see an equation next time, a picture like this pops up in their mind. Um, this is a little fancier. This is more grade eight ish. Um, so I need you to know that this, this was a right triangle and I was just too lazy to put in the right angle symbol. Um, I hope you can see that there is a small green triangle that is stuck on top of the big yellow triangle. And my question is, um, how could you describe the length of the long yellow hypotenuse, the slanty line, but the long one? two different ways. Um, my goal is to use the Pythagorean theorem. And since your principals are not teachers, I should be nice to you and help you here. Um, do you all see that in the little green triangle, there is a side length of one and a side length of one. And that means that the little green hypotenuse is called the square root of two. 
And that's because 1 squared plus 1 squared is 2, and the hypotenuse is the square root of 2. Now, if you look at that picture, it kind of looks like the green hypotenuse is half of the whole hypotenuse, the whole long yellow one, and it is. So the long hypotenuse, you could say, is 2 times the square root of 2, because it's two of those. But other people would look at the big triangle and say the height is 2, the width is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 squared is 4, 4 and 4 is 8, and so the hypotenuse is the square root of 8. That is meant to help to understand why the square root of 8 is double the square root of 2. And it's a visual way to see it instead of just a calculator pipe, you know, putting out numbers and you say, okay, sure, okay. And now you can kind of see what it looks like. So I'm doing this one more quickly because a lot of you are not in grade 8. But the idea is that that would be a very useful way for a kid to see that square root concept how square root of 2 and square root of 8 are related. I'm just going to wait for YRDSB. Yes, this is an eyes on math as well. No, this one isn't. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah. If it, if it looks like it's um, a screenshot, it's eyes on math. I won't tell you every single time. But lots of these are not. Lots of these are just visuals I made for this presentation. Okay, I'm still watching. Oh, okay, maybe it's... Maybe it does look like something. I'd have to go check. All right. So here is something you're going to do. Um, I'm going to initiate a conversation with you in a minute about the topic of ratio and rate. And I'm going to tell you that there, that particular topic, proportional reasoning and ratio and rate, there are tons of visuals that I think are useful to bring that idea out. So I think Ben is going to ask you who would like to try to draw a picture, and he'll give you access, or maybe you all have access. I'm not sure. So Ben, what's happening? Right now, I'm giving access away. So if anybody wants to put their hand up, if you know how, there's the little guy on the top left there where you can just click and go hands up. Or simply, as Marion was doing before, if you just want to type draw. Okay, Jan Janice, Janice, whatever it is, here you go. I'm going to give you drawing and go ahead. Hopefully others of you too. We're not just waiting for one person. Aha, uh -huh. I'm guessing, but you can actually either tell us with your mic or you can just type for us. Um, oh, I guessed wrong. Oh, cool. This is great. I'm assuming this is a mic. And I'm wondering if she's thinking about gear ratios. No, I'm worse than you, Janice. Don't feel bad. Is this about gear ratios or is it about the ratio of the wheel sizes or... The rest of you who are thinking, you can either draw, ask to draw, or you can type. Yeah, I got ratio wheel size. It's perfect. That's exactly what I got from it. So that's great. Um, and it could be the ratio of the circumferences, by the way, which is different than the ratio of the areas, by the way. So that would lead to great discussions as well. If anyone else either want to describe a picture they would draw or take a shot at drawing something that you think about when I say ratio and rate. Okay, Jess is going to draw. But Jess is typing instead. Can't draw. Okay. Why don't you tell us in words what your picture was going to look like? A four to one, um, it'd be interesting, four to one of what? Ingredients in a measuring cup, okie doke. So if you were thinking about um, the ratio of ingredients in, a, in an item you were cooking, just can. <laughs> <clears throat> four tablespoons to one cup. Perfect. Now, four tablespoons to one cup is a pretty interesting rate or ratio. Be well, it's a ratio, sort of. It is. But because tablespoons and cup are different units, so you might say it's a rate. And then we have to talk about what that is. Map with a scale. Beautiful.
distance and time. And again, you could decide all kinds of things, like you could go back to the bike that we saw and turn that into a distance and time sort of story, or it could be cars racing, or it could be something else that makes you think of ratio and rate. Water filling or emptying, absolutely. So how fast or how slow is that happening? Uh, we have our cup, I think, happening. Slope, certainly when you're in grade nine and you're getting more, um, uh, but it can be the slope of a ramp and it doesn't have to, or a skateboard slope. It doesn't have to be sort of grade 90 kind of slope. Okay. Marathon rate. Okay, beautiful. Okay, we're going to move. Um, thank you for your ideas. And I'm going to share an idea that I chose. So um, there are a lot of children's books that actually deal with what I would call ratio and rate. And here is one. Um, it's written by a guy who's written a lot of books about a million. Um, and David Schwartz. And this one is called If Dogs Were Dinosaurs. So do you see any ratio rate sort of ideas in this picture right now? Um, I do. I'm seeing a ratio of how big this dinosaur is compared to the boy, the dinosaur compared to the car, all that sort of stuff. So in the next picture, it says, if your dog were as big as a dinosaur. So what are you seeing now? Where, where do you think you could go with this, with ratio and rate? I agree with you, Simcoe County. That's good. How much food? Some of you know the story. He would travel a lot faster than a regular dog. Beautiful. So it could be it could be about distance covered in certain amount of time. It could be um, his volume compared to the balloon's volume. It could be how much food he would need. It could be the length of the step. All of these are super ideas. And a lot of um, math educators right now are actually using the phrase notice and wonder, and that's what we're just doing now. So I'm just saying to you, notice and wonder, like what might you ask? Now, I told you to ask it about ratio and rate, and I didn't have to, but that's up to you whether you want to do it or not. Um, you could say it's about ratio and rate or not, but you're noticing and wondering and thinking lots of things. So is that a regular dog leash or is it like a longer leash because he's so big, circumference of collar, all these are good. So what they do actually in the picture, in the book is this is the next picture. His dinner would fill up your living room. So do you see already in this picture, there's a million things I could ask. Um, <clears throat> you could ask, um, how many bowls that is compared to what a regular dog eats in one day. It could be what part of the living room is filled up. And that is that an area question or a volume question? Like we could figure that out. You can see part of the dog's face in the window. So there's obviously a lot more dog than we're seeing. And so we could talk about what fraction of the dog's face area we're seeing in the window. Um, you could certainly ask how many bags of dog food you would need for this dog in a day, in a month, in a year um, versus a normal dog. Um, you could certainly ask how many of those little kernels are going on his tongue, how big is his tongue. So there's so much you could do with a thing like this. So ratio and proportion um, has so many possibilities for visual presentation. Um, and given that in Ontario we've had a big focus on proportional reasoning, which is what this is, this is good news for us. It means that you could use lots of visualization kind of tasks to focus on a very important mathematical concept, ratio and proportion. Okay. Um, one of the things that we could consider when we're thinking about visual presentation of mathematical ideas is presenting the problem visually or the student solving the problem visually. So I've actually been sort of presenting problems to you visually. And I haven't shown you so much solving them visually. We'll do that as we go forward. First, we'll look at presenting visually again. Um, I have created a sort of a number line, but I'm missing a lot of it. There's just the one end that says one, and the other end that says a thousand. And there are these five boxes in the middle with bunnies in them. So my question to kids might be, on which numbers might the bunnies be? And why did you pick those numbers? So why don't some of you
give us a suggestion about what numbers you think those money bunnies might be on and why you think that. Okay, so Jess thinks 10 and 100, and I would ask Jess if she were in my class to explain why she picked 10 and 100. So Jess, if you have the energy to do that, that's fine. If you don't, don't sweat it. Okay, Therese thinks that this should be symmetric, and she thinks that middle box is 500, so the first bunny is 498, and the other bunny is 502 because of the symmetry. And you're thinking 10 and 100 because you're thinking, well, that's how it goes. We talk 110, 100, 1,000. And if you said that to me, I would be happy with you, but I would say, what would you call the middle boxes and see what you would say then. Um, Therese has an answer for the middle boxes. Mary Jane's is 3 and 999 because the arrows could represent one. And if you did, I would be happy with you as well. And then I would ask you what's on the other boxes, and I would and you would give me some answers, and then I would say, well, where is 472? And I would try to like shake you up a little bit and see what you did. Um, Just would said, I would say 50 because I'm in grade one and I only know up to 50. That's great. So I, if you were in grade one, I shouldn't be giving you this number line anyway. Um, the five boxes would be numbers that are right after each other. Somebody says, um, somebody says they're using equal partitions. So do you get that? Nobody actually said that every box has to represent one. Maybe, um, there's a scale factor, like it goes up by tens or hundreds or thousands. So I could see someone saying a hundred and or 200 and 800, I don't know, 200, 400, 600, 800 doesn't work, so I'd mess around with that. 2.1 and 2.5 would really blow me away, and I would say, so Melanie, why do you say that? And I would ask you. So what I want to do here is not belabor this particular question, but I want you to see that by essentially leaving out a lot of information, <clears throat> only telling you the one in a thousand, not telling you where this is, I've brought up a much bigger conversation than I would have had. So someone says, not a good scale, they don't like it. All of these would be great conversations. So this would definitely not be a grade one picture. Um, I'm not even sure it'd be a grade three picture. Do you see that I might ask this in the junior years or in the intermediate years? And I think this might be a valuable question. And you might think, but junior kids and intermediate kids don't like bunnies, but I think they still like bunnies. So I think we're okay on that. So yes, or the adult years. So it's about, could there be a scale? If there's not a scale, what assumption should I make? Should I assume symmetry? Should I not assume symmetry? So all this stuff, and I've been saying it a couple times, math is full of assumptions. We never talk to kids about the fact that we're assuming things. We need to talk to them about it. This is a way to do it visually. Okay, here's another picture. Um, this is a picture of jumps on a number line. The first jump is supposed to be starting directly at zero. I know I'm a little off. All of the jumps are supposed to be the same size. Now, my question to you is, if all those jumps are the same size, what could that final landing spot where the question mark be? So let's, Janice has already gone and said 35. Brian said seven. Somebody says it could not be zero. Somebody says it could be 70. Somebody says 35, 75, 700. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So most of you are picking what we call multiples of seven. Thank you, Mary Jane. And you are dead right. Assuming we have a whole number jump, we have to be doing a multiple of seven. And that's great. And that's what I'd want to hear in grade three and four and five. But if I were in, oh, but <clears throat> Simcoe County says, but it could be a hop that's a decimal and it could be seven tenths. And when we talk about tens, we don't talk about multiples of seven anymore, but we still feel good about seven tens and one and four tens and two and one tenth, but we feel a little less good about six tenths. But then eventually we get into grade eight, and in grade eight, it could be anything in the universe because you could make every jump, any fraction you like or any decimal you like, 
and just multiply it by seven and get an answer. So the answer could be, the answer is one. And the reason it's one is that each jump is one seven. Or you could say the answer is four because each jump is four sevens. And so this particular slide works one way in the junior years. It works a different way in the intermediate years. And to me, that's actually great. So I believe if I ask this in a grade eight, most kids would not assume fractions. They would assume whole numbers. Um, somebody said 7x, so I could think algebraically, which would be beautiful as well. Um, so the important idea here is that when you do seven something seven times, it's a multiple of seven, except we only talk about multiples when we're in the whole number world. So that's what the point of this picture is. <clears throat> this one, it, we're going to have a vote. <clears throat> Which group of dots do you think is the reddest group? So vote for either the, the one with four dots or five or six or seven. Okay, I'm, I'm reading this, the chats too. Okay, so this is what I think, <clears throat> excuse me, seem to be coughing today. Um, this is what I think is a good thing. Um, you're adults, you're intelligent people, and we're still not all on the same place on this. So that means it's worth a discussion. That's what it tells me. And if it's worth a discussion for us, it's definitely worth a discussion for kids. Um, many of you, in fact, most of you have decided it is the bottom left, but you're interpreting what the reddest is. And somebody could say, well, I thought you meant, and you have to listen to that kid and hear that kid out. Um, from a ratio perspective or a percentage perspective, you are correct that from a percentage point of view, the bottom left is the reddest. Um, but you, some of you picked a different one. I don't think you're full, so you had a reason. So I would want to hear your reasons and figure out, well, someone might pick this one because. Now, I'm thinking that when a kid quickly looks visually, they might look at the first top left one and think, well, wow, that's like really red. Um, like I only see four and like three of them are red. That's like really red. And yeah, and so it's, it's, it's kind of good to have this discussion. Um, in the end, I want you to tell you that I picked these carefully. Um, I wanted a three red to one yellow compared to a four red to one yellow compared to a five red to one yellow. So that kids understand that if you're comparing three to one, four to one, five to one, the five to one is the reddest. But I also went five to one versus five to two because both of them have five reds, but because the guy on the right has an extra yellow, it changes my mind. So someone who says, I'm thinking about tinting paint, that is what I was thinking about. But I want to hear kids out and see what they say. For me, this would be a good discussion to evoke notions of proportion, percent, ratio. You can keep typing WAPS. I'll be watching. Okay. Um, while you're typing. Oh, okay. Don't worry about that. Um, do you get, by the way, I'm just going to go back here a minute. Oops. That you don't need to calculate. You, you can reason it through and you can say to yourself three to one versus four to one versus five to one, but it's five to one, five to one versus five to two is five to one. And it's not wrong to count calculate, but I wanted you to see that kids could learn not to calculate. Okay, next one. Um, if all the fruit were blueberries, how many blueberries would there be? So I just downloaded this from the internet, I guess illegally, didn't I? And um, it looked good, and I thought, um, the peaches are big, the, the strawberries are big, the blueberries are little. So this is essentially a unit change or ratio question. If they were all blueberries, like how many would I need? So do you get, kids would have to do a lot of thinking. So how many blueberries, how many blueberries would replace a single strawberry? 
versus a single peach. And how do you tell? Because you can't take them off the page. So what are you going to do? And what measurements are you going to take? And are you going to worry about how, <clears throat> how high the food goes or just the flat part of it? Like different kids might make different decisions. And I'm actually going to say that I think we need to let them make different decisions. Um, and that's a good thing. And making different decisions is actually what I want to happen. I don't want to say to all kids, and these are the factors that you should take into account. Like, I want you to think about this, and I want you to think about this, and I want you to measure this, and whatever. You want to give them space to make all those decisions. Okay, I'm waiting for the typing. Does the whole space need to be covered? So I'm letting you decide. We are debating area versus count, and I'm going to say I'll let you decide. About five for every peach, about two and a half for every strawberry. And if Therese said that to me, I'd say back to Therese, like, where'd you come up with those numbers? Oh, my gosh. Denise has done a lot of work already. And it's all cool. And so what you're doing is you're mimicking a classroom. So some of you are just, like, hanging back. And some of you said, I did a visual estimate, and I'd say back to you. So, like, tell me more. Like, how did you come up with this five blueberries for every peach or two and a half for every strawberry? And Janice would tell me. And what I really want is for kids to have the opportunity to make their own decisions and explain themselves. So when you ask me, should you cover everything? That's a good question because right now you can see some of the white. And the question is, if you had blueberries, maybe you could cover it better and you wouldn't see any of the white. And that's a good question. And she's a some, what about inside the cake? And so some people will do inside the cake, some people won't. So when I talk to teachers, one of the things I frequently say, and I continue to say, and I'm not changing my mind, is that we need not to tell the kids exactly what to, all the constraints are. We need them to decide on what their constraints are, solve the problem based on their constraints, Help kids see that if you have a different list of constraints than your other friend over here, you might have a different answer, and that's why. I think that's sort of what we're trying to get at at math with what I'm going to call inquiry or what I'm going to call um, pro thinking, process thinking. And I think that when we try to tie it all down, we work against ourselves. Someone's using a weight measurement like I'm cool. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. Next question. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about this one. I do seem to be talking a lot, right? Um, this is Pythagoras again, but only it looks different. So this time, instead of putting squares on the sides of the triangle, uh, the right triangle, which is yellow, I put triangles on the sides of the, tri of the sides of the triangle. So is that okay too? Like, are the two little areas in total the same as the big area? That could be a conjecture, an investigation, and you can decide yeah or no. Um, just in case you're curious, the answer is yeah. Um, if they're all what we call similar triangles, I was trying to draw equilateral triangles, so I think in my case it's actually true, but this is something kids could explore. Um, this is a little video. It's pathetic but cute, and so we're going to let Ben play it. It has to do I with yarn. how much yarn I'm going to need to cover this whole sheet of paper. I think that's 22 centimeters. Hmm. 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 Okay. Pathetic, but the point comes across. Um, when you turn one dimension, which is a line, into two dimensions, it's remarkable how much linear stuff you need to cover an area. So I'm going to ask kids, how much yarn do you think I'm going to need? Is it meters? Is it kilometers? If it's meters, how many? If it's kilometers, how many to cover that entire sheet of paper? And I'm going to make them guess, and then I'm going to give them probably a smaller piece of paper so that they can see how the change in going from one dimension to two dimensions. So um, for those of you who knit, like it's remarkable that you have this hugely long thing of yarn that turns into a relatively small area. Like why is that? is an interesting mathematical question, and that's what that's all about. Um, this is high school. Those of you who are not high school, don't freak out. Um, if I asked a grade 11 student what might the equation be here, um, I 
haven't been precise. I've been a little bit inaccurate. You can see that the height's pretty much three and minus three, but you can't see exactly where the crosses are. So kids have to guess. So I ask them what might that equation be. Tells me really deeply if they understand what we call sinusoidal functions. And this would be a way for me actually to even assess whether they have that understanding. Um, I'm also going to look at problems that are solved visually. I did warn you, Christine, it wouldn't be too much high school because we're imbalanced today. Um, solved visually. Um, one of the questions we ask kids um, in the intermediate grades is what is a common multiple of four and three? And what we mean is what's a number that is divisible by both four and three, a whole number that's evenly divisible by both four and three. I'm just going to show you a bunch of slides to show you the concept visually. So here's three, the red little train is three and the green little train is four. And a, a multiple means a bunches of reds or bunches of greens. So I can see now that red and green do not match. And if I stuck on two reds, I'm too long compared to a green. But if I stuck on two reds and two greens, I'm too short. So I keep doing it and I keep doing it and I keep doing it. And magically at some point, and I think it's called 12, my trains are the same length because four trains of three actually match three trains of four. This completely helps kids see what do you mean when you say common multiple? It's like, oh, that's what it is. And they actually can see what it looks like. I'm waiting for Peterborough. Yes, that process is also great for finding common denominators because finding a common denominator is about finding a common multiple. Um, this is a problem about percents that I might ask in a grade seven or eight or nine class. Leah bought a jacket for 40% off. Mel bought a jacket for 20% off. They paid the same amount. How were the original prices related? So this is what we would call a thinking question. Kids would have to come up with some kind of a plan, some kind of a strategy to come up with an idea because I didn't give you enough information to be dead on like this is the answer. Um, they have to realize that Leah paid 60% and Mel paid 80% and that 60% of one number matches 80% of another number and so the question is, what could those numbers be to make that happen? So there's tons of ways you can solve this numerically, algebraically, but I'm going to show you a visual solution, which if you have grade seven or eight teachers in your school, I think they might like. So here's Leah and here's Mel. Do you see that Leah's 60% price matched Mel's 80% price? So I made a red line matching 60 to 80. Well, in order to make 60 match to 80, I went back and made 30 match to 40. And then I could have gone back and made 15 match to 20. So I used proportions. And then in the end, my question is, what does Mel's 100% match on Leah's? And can you see that the one price must have been 75% of the other price because the 100 matches the 75? It's a very, very cool way, and I did it way too fast for you to take it all in so you can think about it later, of showing relationships between percents and showing them visually on something we call double number lines. And these are very powerful for kids. So the, this is a concept. It helps you see if 60% of a guy matches 80% of another guy, this only works if 75% of the guy matches 100% of the other guy. So that's what these number lines are all about. Um, here's a problem that you might solve in a, an intermediate or a high school classroom. Um, these are the problems we used to call artificial, and I guess they still are artificial, except they're not that artificial, and it's kind of interesting how they work. So here's the problem. Jane's mom was 28 when Jane was born. She's now four and a half times as old as Jane. I'm sure you can all remember these problems now. How old are they both now? And so there are algebraic ways of solving this equation, and you can solve them algebraically, but I'm not going to. I'm going to look at it visually. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you Jane as a little stack of two cubes, and I'm going to show you mom as four and a half stacks, because mom is four times as old as Jane. So the, I'm representing the idea visually of what is four and a half of something look like. And now you can probably guess why I made Jane two 
cubes tall because I couldn't have shown the half other ones. So then I say to myself, so if that's Jane and that's mom, remember the only other thing we know is that mom was 28 when Jane was born. So mom's extra stuff must be the 28 because that way, as Jane has grown older, mom's grown older, and that's the gray stuff, mom had that extra 28 on Jane. You can see that there are seven cubes worth 28. Oh yeah, I think that must mean each cube is worth four. So Jane must be worth eight and mom must be worth 36. And it turns out that's a solution to the problem. So it's solving a problem visually rather than algebraically. Um, when I was at OAME last week, I did a session for Kata K-8 teachers, but some colleagues of mine from high school came as well, and they happened to be sitting close to me. And I was showing them problems for primary and junior that they were saying, this is particularly for you, Christine, that they would use in high school because I could now write the algebra for this, and it would mean something to a kid. If they just write the algebra in the beginning, it doesn't mean anything. Now it means something. So it was just amazing how many primary and junior problems I wrote that turned into algebra that was meaningful at the high school level, but it was meaningful for kids in their own way. All right, so my question to you is, um, how might you encourage your teachers to see the power of visuals and math? So I'm gonna show you a few more things, but I wanna take a little breather here. If you're in a group and you wanna to talk to each other and not to the rest of us right now, we're cool. If you're all alone and you need friends, use the chat box and we'll all talk to each other. But based on what I've done so far, um, do you see your, yourself encouraging your teachers to see the power of visuals and how might you do it? So talk to each other or we'll talk communally in the chat box for people who wish to do that. Um, we'll do this for maybe three minutes. Then you can keep me on track for three minutes if you don't mind. That's a great idea, Jess. I think, Brian, you're right that starting where they're at and not like throwing it from nowhere is pretty important. You could. So there is the Eyes on Math resource that you could use. Um, it's less for the high school people, but it could be for a certain K-8. Um, demoing is a great idea. You could find something that you like that I showed you today that you might demo. Good. Therese. I think you're right, WAPS. I, I don't know how to who you are, I'd say it better, um, that that you actually, teachers have to live it themselves a little bit too. Um, so that's what you're doing today. And my experience has been the same as yours. That, okay, hi. Um, that, in fact, um, they need to see it themselves to see how powerful it can be. Um, a staff meeting, open the idea of no final answer, good. Go plan and co-teach. Now, when you say authentic tasks, again, it, you're, you are really seeking authentic tasks. I, you saw that I downloaded some pictures from the internet, some pictures from visuals, so there are places you can get these things. Do the math we want the kids to do for sure. Okay, classroom walks to find our favorite visuals in the school is great. And then it's like, what do they have to do with math? It might be even interesting to ask kids what they think it has to do with math. Of course you can borrow, that's part of the deal. Okay, three minutes, we're, we're, we're moving on guys, sorry. Um, we're gonna have one more time to talk about those things, but this is a first one and then we'll talk some more.
I just have a few more things I want to show you in the time we still have together. So we are going to move on to the next slide. I promise we're coming back. Um, building connections. So um, mathematics has lots of connections in it. And I think visuals have opportunities there too. This is a picture I might show a grade one student or two student or kindergarten student and ask them if they see addition or subtraction or both. Um, and I think we're not going to get a universal answer that's the same for all kids. Um, Simcoe County says they see both. And if a kid says, I see this or I see that, that's great. And I would say back to them, so tell me what addition you do see or tell me what subtraction you do see. And they would talk to me about more of that. Um, Shanti is typing as well. Um, I think I've done this with kids and some kids only see addition. Um, some kids say to me, well, there would be subtraction if the helicopters flew away. And indeed, there would. Um, and they don't see both. that They need the helicopters to fly away. Um, some people say, I see subtraction there. Um, the boats can float away. Correct. But I'm going to propose there's subtraction if nobody floats or flies away. Here is one subtraction. I see 8 minus 5 which tells me, thank you, Janice, exactly how many more boats there are than helicopters. 8 minus 5 is exactly what tells me that. So I see 8 minus 5. Um, I also see 13 minus 5. There are 13 vehicles. If five of them are this kind, subtraction says what? how many are the other kind. So my proposal is I want kids in our classrooms in Ontario to understand there is no such thing as an addition that doesn't have it, a buried in subtraction or a subtraction that has a buried in addition. They come as a package deal. There is no one without the other. That's a hugely important concept. This visual is just to like put it on the table so we can talk about it. Um, another thing most of you know about this whole issue about how some kids, some adults, refuse to call squares rectangles. Squares are squares and rectangles are rectangles and they're not the same. But we know that in our curriculum we are supposed to teach kids that in fact squares are rectangles, um, special ones indeed, but still rectangles. So in order to get that idea kind of happening, um, we make an analogy to people having different names. So you can see that this woman is being called Mom and Auntie Rhoda, Rhonda and Dr. James. And so kids can relate to that. They understand what that means. So the question is, if it's a shape, what are the different names I can give this shape? And eventually want them to understand that somebody only cares that they're a quadrilateral, but somebody else cares that they're a rectangle, but somebody else cares that they're a square. So it's to kind of get that discussion going. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. I'll say this one quickly. Um, this is much like one I showed you before, but you see that there's little jumps and big jumps and then repeated little and repeated big and repeated little and repeated big. If you picked whole number amounts, which I did ask for this time, and asked what number the question mark could be, um, I'm going to tell you now that 15 is a possible answer, but 14 is not. And 16 is not, and 17 is not, but 18 is. And so then the question will be, who is possible and who is not possible? So um, do you see that if you picked 1 and 2 for your jumps, 1 and 2, you would be landing at 9. But if you picked 1 and 3, you would be landing at 12. And if you picked 1 and 4, you would be landing at 15. And if you picked 10 and 30, you would be landing at 120. And it turns out they're all multiples of three. And the question is, how come that happened? And I want kids to see, this is what we call the distributive principle, that if you have a little jump and a big jump, and you think about it as a package deal, I have three packages, that means a multiple of three. And we teach kids something very fancy called the distributive principle, but here it is live, like this is what the distributive principle is. Um, this is about equations. This is very important, I think, particularly in grade 6 to 12, that we use equations to mean different things. So on the top balance, you see two bags called X matching eight cubes. And the only way they could possibly be balanced if is there were four in each of the X bags. Like, it is the only way. It's what we call solving for the unknown. The unknown was the four in the bag. 
But look at the bottom one. This time, here's the equation I would be writing. 2x plus 2 plus 2 equals 2x plus 4. So that's an equation too. It's the truth. But anything could be in the bags. You could have 100 in each bag. You could have 1,000 in each bag. You could have 1 in each bag, and it would still be the truth. So this is an equation which is about two different names for the same amount. We use equations in these two very different ways, and we do a rather poor job of talking to kids about this. So this visual is designed to help me talk to kids about this kind of equation versus that kind of an equation. So an equation with an unknown means there is an answer, or maybe when you're in grade 10, two answers or whatever. And only that answer works to make it balance. But there are lots of statements that are true for lots of values. So it could have been 2x equals x plus x could have been one of those kinds of pictures as well. Really important discussion for grades 6 to 12. Um, this is a picture um, to help kids see. And I should have animated it, so just pretend I did. First look at the top left gray. Then add in the orange in your brain. Then add in the green. Then add in the blue. Then add in the burgundy, etc. Do you see that I'm showing you that squares are made up by adding an odd number to the next 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 odd number, number etc. So this is a well-known historical fact that this, that if you add the odd numbers starting at one consecutively, you get perfect squares. And this like shows a kid, oh yeah, that's why. Not just like, yeah, you do it and it worked. Yeah, it did. This is like, that's why it's happening. Oh, I see it. It's odd because I have to have a side length that was already there, a side length that was already there. Those are equal. And an extra little guy to be the corner. That's why it's odd. All sorts of good stuff happens. Um, this is high school, Christine, so this is for you. Um, I want, in this case, for kids to understand that the vertical red lines represent the difference between 3x minus 2 and 2x minus 2. It's like how much more is 3x minus 2 than 2x minus 2. So it's like subtracting 2x minus 2 from 3x minus 2, and the answer happens to be x. And what you can see is each red line has a distance, which is the x value below it. So I'm helping kids see another way why 3x minus 2 subtract 2x minus 2 is x. This is another way to see it. This is also high school. High, the rest of you just hang on for a minute. Um, I have a red curve that shows y equals x cubed and a black curve that shows y equals x to, one to the 1 third. Like, those aren't just random things. When I look at it, I see symmetry, and I start exploring, well, why would there be symmetry? And that leads me to good discussions about inverse functions. The same is true here with x to the fourth and x to the one-fourth. There's also symmetry. How come it happened? It leads me to important discussions. Okay, proving ideas. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit here because we don't have tons of time. Um, but it's important to me for you to see some of these. Um, I want you to look at those two trains of Lincoln cubes. I'm, I know you can all see that the first train is two cubes longer than the second train. The two cubes are the extra two guys on the top. All right, now watch. I stuck another cube on the other end of each, and the top train is still two cubes longer. And I stuck another number on, and the top train is still two cubes longer. And the top train is still two cubes longer. And what I want kids to know is that if you want to find the difference between two numbers, which does mean how much longer is one than the other, then you can increase both of them by the same amount, and it won't change the difference. So when I had it back here, you were looking at 2, 4, 6, 8 minus 6. And here you were looking at 9 minus 7. And here you were looking at 10 minus 8, and they all have the same answer. And I want kids to know that if I were subtracting 53 minus 29, I don't like that. I'll make it 54 minus 30 by adding 1 to both values and not change the answer. So this is hugely valuable for mental math. 
Um, this is also valuable for mental math. Um, do you see that there are five counters on the left and eight on the right? If two count frogs move over, I'm at three and ten, but I still have the same frog. So I want kids to know that when you add two numbers, you can move guys from one number to the other number without changing the answer. That is also hugely valuable for mental math. So I know I'm going faster now, but it's just to tell you why that's there. Um, this is really just cool. Um, do you see three rows of five? I know you do. You see three rows of five. Now I'm going to do something to those three rows of five. I'm going to take the guys on the right. I'm going to move them below. And now you see it turned into one less than four rows of four. Three rows of five turned into one less than four rows of four. And that's the truth because 15 is one less than 16. Here's another picture. This is four rows of six. Four rows of six. You can guess what I'm going to do. Take those guys, move them down, and I'm one less than five rows of five. So that means that if I want to know when numbers are two apart, like if I want 79 times 81, I could say, oh, it's one less than 80 times 80, and I could do 80 times 80 in my head. So it's kind of cool for mental math. But for those of you who are high school, all I'm going to tell you is I just showed you, but I won't say any more, that n plus 1 times n minus 1 is n squared minus 1. So you figure that out. Okay. Um, this one is meant to show you, look at the numbers that are in yellow. What is true about all my numbers in yellow? Indeed, they are prime numbers. So the top row is different. They are odd, but they are also prime. Two, of course, is the exception for odd. Do you see that, um, except for the first row, all of those prime numbers land in two columns? I never see another one in the column starting with two, or the column starting in three, or four, or six. So I talk to kids about, well, why did that happen? And we discuss it. So I think you can quickly see everything in the two, four, and six are even, so I couldn't have those. And if you look at the guys in the three row column, all of them happen to be multiples of three. That's why they're not prime. So this is a way of visually seeing why every prime number beyond two and three is either one less than a multiple of six. That means it's in the five column or one more than a multiple of six. That means it's in the one column. So it's a way of seeing another mathematical truth by just setting up my hundreds chart in a call in six columns instead of ten. Um, we're skipping this one. Um, do you see here quickly that when I wanted to add two, four, six, eight, ten, and twelve, it was smart to put the two with the twelve, the four with the ten, and the six with the eight, because now it's three fourteen. And I would leave that as an initiation into the next question. Um, this is a picture. This is very old. Like old meaning that like I didn't create it, it's been around a long time. Um, that shows why if you stick a pink half with a pink quarter, with a pink eighth, with a pink sixteenth, with a pink thirty-second, with a pink sixty-fourth, that eventually you'll have a whole pink square. And that's why the sum of all those fractions is one, which is a sophisticated high school idea. Um skipping this one. I'm gonna just show you this one. Um Uh oh, something happened. Um, what kind of oh yeah, what kind of picture might prove something about the sum of any three? Go ahead, Ben. I'm sorry about the sum of any three consecutive whole numbers. So think of three numbers that are in a row, like four, five, six, eight, nine, ten. Um, what could you draw that would help you see something about those answers? Actually, Ben, take it away. We don't have enough time. I'm gonna let it go, and I'm just gonna do it because I'm worried about the time. Um, do you see that those look like three consecutive numbers? Gray is tiny, one more than yellow. Red is one more than gray. What I'm going to do is stack them. And do you notice that the stack is the same as the stack of three grays? So let's try that. 10, 11, and 12, when you add them, you get 33, which is three elevenths. 
four, five, six, when you add them, is 15, which is three fives. So it turns out that if you have three numbers in a row, you always get three of the middle guy. And that leads, by the way, to algebra in high school, but it leads to just fooling around with number relationships in the younger grades. Um, you might ask kids to represent virtually every problem they meet with a math picture. So I'm going to call it a math picture to say that I don't want them like making beautiful like elephants and trees because then they get all involved in their elephant or tree and there's no more math happening. Um, I want them to represent objects with simple little shapes or dots or lines so that the picture gives them insight into relationships, not the actual objects. So here is an example of a problem I could set. Kira had three times as many books as Zayden. Together they had 40 books. How many did each have? Just imagine what kind of a picture you might draw to see that. And I was going to have you draw a picture, but I'm worried about time again. So I'm just going to show you. Just think, though, for a minute. What kind of thing? Don't, don't draw books. Books take too long. Kira had three times as many books as Zayden. Together they had 40 books. Here is my simple little picture. Do you see that that shows me Kira has three times as many books as Zayden? Beautiful Janice was going to do that. And what I need is the total to be 40. So do you get, I just keep doing that over and over and over and over till I get 40. And when I'm done, I see how many books Zayden has. I see how many books Kira has. We want to teach kids to represent. And when I say draw, it could be obviously with linking cubes, which is make, um, to see those relationships. And the pictures help me see what's going on. Um, this one is tricky. You can look at it later. It's interesting, but it's too much for you right now. Um, here's a simple one. What does 25% look like? What does 90% look like? You could imagine. Think about the picture you might draw. Don't draw it. Just think. I'm betting most of you are thinking of 25% as a quarter of something. And that most of you are thinking of 90% as most of something. And that's exactly what I want out of kids. So here is my quarter. So do you believe that the white is a quarter of the yellow? Yeah? And then I'd say to you, yes, thank you, PB and CCDSB. Um, and then I'd say a quarter in what way, and I'd want kids to realize it's volume, but theoretically they would have created this picture and they would tell me it's volume. Um, I also use volume in the cylinder. I purposely use volume because I think we stick to area too much and I just wanted you to go to another place and think about volume. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about this problem. I was in a class actually fairly close to Peterborough, but in the um, Hastings Prince Edward Ward. And um, I presented a grade three class with the following problem. A rectangle's perimeter is three times its length. What could the length and width be? So that's actually a tricky problem. I might even give that to grade nine students. And the question is, uh, so what I get, did is I gave them linking cubes. That was making it more visual for them. And they were build, build, building all kinds of rectangles with their linking cubes. And the truth is, almost every kid in the class, I think every, um, found at least one rectangle. Some of them found uh, several, and they saw relationships and whatever. But there was one girl who blew me away, and you're going to see her work. So this is what this girl said to me. She said, see that set of sticks up top? She said, that's my length. And she just held up a set of sticks like that, uh, of cubes, and said, that's my length. And she said, so three of them is my perimeter. Yes, correct, Janice. And three of them is my perimeter. And so she realized if the perimeter is three times the length, it means if the length is one stick, the perimeter is three sticks. All of you want all of your kids to know this, and a lot of kids don't. So then she said, so this is all you do. So she took two of the sticks and put them horizontal, and she had her third stick. And I think you know what she's going to do, because she has to make a rectangle. She split it in half. She moved them. And she said, see in there, that's my rectangle. It's six by three. Janice said two to one. Six by three is two to one. I asked this young girl, did it matter how long her stick was? She said to me, no, as long as you could break it in half. 
it was a kid all of us would die for to have in our class. It was amazing. She used visuals to prove an algebraic concept. Um, this is something I did with kids a bunch of years ago. I asked kids to help me create a glossary for a book. And here are a couple of the entries I got. These are two of my favorites. So it would be interesting for you to say to your kids, like if you were showing a picture that showed multiplication, like what would your picture look like? If you were showing a picture that said prime number, what would your picture look like? So these are examples. Um, so I wanted to end, and that's why I rushed, to give you a little bit of time for us to say, I think today I've used visuals to introduce conversations, set up problems, build connections, prove, and communicate. Um, where do you see the power? Do you see it more for one of those than the other? Do you see it for all of them? Like, what do you see? So there is a chat box, and we have just a few more minutes, but I'd be delighted to chat with you. I agree with you, Janice. For me, amazing for proving is sort of where I'm at. Um, I've discovered that tons and tons of algebraic concepts can be clarified using visuals. Building connections and understandings, I totally get. Creating conversations, for sure. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Caroline, that if teachers um, use visuals, it might, I think I often say to teachers, we come with the baggage of what we learned, and the kids don't have that same baggage. And maybe these visuals would help us get rid of some of that baggage, because that isn't the way we did math, and it might be useful for helping them kind of get rid of that and anticipating answers. Yep, I think all students will have an entry point with a the visual. They can at least tell you what they're seeing. Um, and because they're talking, you are getting insight into their thinking. Um, certainly, some of the visuals I use were everyday life. Not all of them, but obviously you could use more visuals that were everyday life. I do think it will, it may be difficult for ELLs to prove, I'm not positive, um, because I think that it gives them tools that they can actually handle better than language tools. So I, it might even be helpful that way, certainly helpful to communicate. So um, for those averse to using visual manipulatives, um, you guys are principals, you shouldn't be entertaining teachers who are averse, averse to using manipulatives, but I guess you're stuck. So um, it is a step up. Um, for me, um, our message is whether it's manipulatives or visuals, math is, relationships can be shown and it's really pretty important. I do think they even the playing field for communication. I've met kids who really have difficulty um, verbally, certainly in writing, explaining their thinking, but who are really pretty good at showing. All right, everyone, we have one more typing, clean and definitive proof, okay. Yeah, I think we all know that we have different sides of our brain and these visual school skills are really, really useful for solving problems. So thank you for your attention this morning. If you have any last questions, you can throw them at me, but otherwise, like enjoy the rest of your day. You're more than welcome.